Imagine you're hiking through the woods. You stumble across a metal box that is weather-worn and looks very old. Inside that box are 21 pictures, 3 movie reels, and documents that are also weather-worn. You'd be a bit shocked to find these, right? Before we get into that, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. In 1997, a man hiking near Indian Lake, New York, came across this metal box. It was sticking up a few inches from the ground in an area of wilderness that was rarely traveled and not near any road or marked paths. He proceeded to dig it out of the ground and discovered the contents of the box were quite unusual. The box had no lock and the lid was marked with an upside down triangle and two circles. Inside the box was said, 21 photos, three 8mm movie reels, and other documents. The box wouldn't be heavily investigated until 2002 when the original finder of the box passed away of lung cancer and had passed it on to his nephew John. John began posting on October 2nd, 2005 until roughly 2013 to his blog, IndianLakeProject.blogspot.com. There he told the story of how he came into possession of the box and what was in the box. He also opened an email where people could ask questions about the story and the things that he had posted on his blog spot. The images in the box seemed to be that of a non-permanent military installation located in the woods of Indian Lake, New York, as well as military personnel and children. According to documents found in the box, the location was in operation from 1952 to 1955 and was jointly used by Army, Navy, and Air Force intelligence officers at the time. Its existence was highly classified and besides a few essential personnel, not many people knew about the base or its location. Some of the photos show military personnel standing with children as well as what appears to be a civilian handler standing with a military personnel member. Now one would wonder if he was a scientist or involved involved in the whole story, which we'll get into shortly. Assuming these were all taken at the same location, you'd figure that it was the Indian Lake Project location and this non-permanent military installation. Photos of three children with the names Roger, Sally, and Sam were in this box. These photos and the children themselves had been given a very specific number and they were printed on the photos. What was the number of reference to, you might ask yourself, and you'd be smart to. Uh, according to John and what his uncle had told him, that it was probably a number given based on how many children were at the base at that time. The child named Roger had been given number 837. If that's true that it was a reference to how many children were on the base or whatever the case may be, that's a lot of children at said base. Why were these kids there? Were they family of the officers? And was something weird going on? Roger, number 837, can be seen in other images at different ages, and he by far had the most images in the box. Pictures of Roger drinking at a table and what appears to be attempting to count were included as well. None of this sheds light on what the kids were doing there or why they were numbered. John did speculate that some of the local adoptions in the area were to people with a military background and that potentially the missing children in the area could have been part of the Indian Lake Project's numbers. Now, I know you're saying to yourself, just tell us what John speculated they were doing with the children. Okay. According to John, the Indian Lake installment was tied to experiments in mind control and ESP. Yes, you heard that right. Mind control and ESP. According to evidence he says he found in the box, they were originally experimenting on adults at this location, but pivoted to children because of their minds being easier to manipulate and condition. Although he never showed the documents to this date, 
Since the 8mm rails were so heavily damaged because of the water, he didn't want to actually run them and watch them, so he showed images from those 8mm rails. And he was able to find pictures of two boys in what looks like a cage being fed and as well as one of the boys wearing headphones and listening to sounds of some type. After posting about these reels and the theories he put forward from the documents and research, this is when John drops his big theory that the whole Indian Lake project was associated with Project Artichoke. In John's own writing, he states, Project Artichoke was a CIA project that researched interrogation methods and arose from Project Bluebird in 1951. The project studied hypnosis, among other methods, to produce amnesia in subjects. Project Artichoke was an offensive program of mind control that gathered together the intelligence divisions of the Army, Navy, Air Force, and FBI. I believe the ILP, Indian Lake Project, was a part of Project Artichoke. The scope of the project was outlined in a memo dated January 1952 that stated, can we get control of an individual to the point where he will do our bidding against his will and even against fundamental laws of nature such as self-preservation? For those of you watching who are wondering what Project Artichoke was, you may know it by the name it was renamed to in 1953, that being MKUltra. That's right, John had tied the contents of the box to MKUltra, and that's where things start to get very strange for John. In late 2005, John decided to visit the location where the box was discovered in Indian Lake, New York. He knew he wouldn't be able to find the exact location of the box's burial, but he wanted to investigate the surrounding area since he believed it was on or near the grounds of the Indian Lake project. After returning from his trip, John released images of the area which included structures in the middle of the woods that didn't seem to belong. It appears to me that these are supports for a building, something much taller than a standard building height. What were these doing in such a secluded place? At this point in this mysterious story, John stated that he didn't want to post any more of the contents of the box online because he didn't believe it would be in his best interest. The reason for the sudden change was he had started receiving phone calls to his house with just silence on the other end. He also claims his house was broken into and searched, however nothing was taken. I attempted to search for break-in records around the area at this point in time, but without more to go on, I couldn't determine if this statement by John was true or not. However, John stated this on October 26, 2005. My house was broken into and searched, but nothing was taken. The box and its contents had been secretly hidden outside of my house. I did this shortly after the phone calls began. It is obvious to me that I hit a nerve when I mentioned the documents I have and that I was considering perhaps posting them here at some point. I am no longer going to post anything. I'm done. I hope anyone who stumbles onto this site will read it from the beginning and continue to stay interested in this story. For those of you who haven't followed this blog, I am sorry, but my family and their peace of mind come first. As disturbing as these photos and documents are, the last few days and my family have been even more so, which is why I'm saying goodbye. This begs the question, who buried the box originally? Were they involved with whatever was going on or were they attempting to just get the truth out? And would John's mystery ever be solved? Turns out he truly wasn't done with his search around the Indian Lake project. In late June 2006, John began posting to his blog again, saying the reason he decided to continue his investigation was because he wanted to find answers and bring awareness to the child victims of the Indian Lake Project. Also, while letting us further into his personal life, John said, Like I said before, much has happened since I stopped posting. In short, my wife and I have separated and about three weeks ago I moved to New York. Being closer to Indian Lake, I am able to visit the area I believe is connected to the project. This has yielded some interesting finds. With more time to search the area, I have found more of the concrete structure, which I now believe to be support beams for a road. Once I located a few more, I realized what they were, and they were all aligned perfectly. It is now clear to me there used to be a road in the middle of the woods. Perhaps this was the road into and out of the camp itself. 
I am currently exploring more to find either the end of the road or the beginning. One would ask themselves now, is John obsessed? And is he a nut who lost his marriage over this whole thing he was investigating? To me, it seems like the only answer we can assume. Being that after the separation, he decided to move closer to the Indian Lake Project location. At this point, John had also received emails about his investigation from a woman he refers to as Mary, who claimed to have first-hand knowledge of the camp because her father was stationed there. And she could remember her parents talking about the children of Indian Lake Project. As well as the fact, according to John, that her father's name was on the manifest he found in the metal box. Mary seemed to be telling John what he wanted to hear. She said she could tell John things that would make his jaw drop. This piqued his interest and he decided to work with her on the project. That would be a very bad choice for him. Mary began to make weird requests like John should send her the originals of the photos and documents so she could see them in person as well as making statements that didn't add up. John's skepticisms grew more and more with the Mary situation. She attempted to mend fences after this by tying members of the Indian Lake Project to World War II soldiers associated with Project Paperclip. People besides Mary requested scans of the documents that John referred to in multiple posts. However, he never produced them, whether it was out of fear or maybe he didn't have them at all. And that was all part of his elaborate story or his game. At this point, if you've been paying attention, John seems to be a conspiracy theorist. So he bought it hook, line, and sinker from Mary. Now that he had heard something else way out there that tied to this project, he started going into the area more often to investigate. This brought several new pieces of evidence to light. A structure found in the area that John actually filmed and uploaded to his YouTube channel, Indian Lake Project, on October 10th, 2006, titled Woods 82606. As you saw, it shows some sort of structure out in the woods of the Indian Lake area. And he claimed to have more footage, however, as many other things in this story, those clips were never released by John. He did release pictures of what appeared to be an underground structure of some sort, and a map of the structure which he had investigated. As you can see, the structure seems to be mostly empty except for the generator room and a few beds. These beds shown here don't seem to match the beds shown in the footage from the 8mm reels. However, John released these prior to showing these underground structure images. Who knows, maybe they are the same, but from what I can tell, they are not. As time went by, John seems to get deeper and deeper into the MK Ultra story, even claiming to have found articles online that tied Jonestown to a man named in the box and associated with the Indian Lake Project. If you don't know what Jonestown is, I'll provide a link down below so you can check it out yourself. And his conspiracy theories further began to stretch. In April 2007, he came back from two months without posting and began talking about NutraSweet or Aspartame, Donald Rumsfeld, being followed by white vans, and more. Well, why the sudden flip in personality to the extreme, and the pivot in how he presented things? Had he gone off the deep end of conspiracy theory? Why had he shifted from his heavy focus on Indian Lake to these other topics? Was he trying to tie things together? Now, I have my own theory on this, and I'm going to toss it out there, it's a little weird, but maybe John lost control of the blog spot page or worse. Around July 2007 is when all of his posts begin to fall apart. He posted an image of a dead bird he had found on his doorstep, or he claimed to have found on his doorstep, a truck that he had supposedly found in the woods near Indian Lake, which through some sleuthing by, you know, Reddit, the internet, autists, they determined that it was stock images. Did the fact that he had posted these stock photos discredit the whole blog and everything else? In my eyes, potentially, but maybe that's what someone wanted us to believe, that it was all faked. John stopped posting in January 2008, and he seems to be gone. He doesn't say why or if he had found any more, just out of nowhere, 
gone. That's where Minnie thought this story would end, seeing as months had gone by without a word from John. And from 2008 to uh, roughly 2013, it was very scarce postings. He would randomly pop back up every few months, uh, even with gaps of years going by before responding or posting anything. In late 2013, John stated he would start using his Twitter account, Indian LK Project, to post updates and that he had some new information to share with everyone, but never posted to his Twitter again. Something definitely changed. Someone so adamant to discover the truth of what happened at Indian Lake just stops abruptly and abandons it all? Weird. That is, if any of John's story is true at all. Leaving so many unanswered questions that may never be solved. Was this box real or was it a fabrication just like the stock images? Why the sudden shift in personality? Why start covering things so far outside the original story? And where did John go? Why did he stop posting and why were there so many gaps? And was there really a military project at Indian Lake? tied to MK Ultra. If I'm being honest, maybe John made it all up as an elaborate story or potential ARG and simply got bored with the project. However, without being able to talk to John himself, we may never know. I have reached out to both emails listed on the blog spot to see if they're still active and hopefully I'll get a response. If I do, I'll make a follow-up video. If any of you have any more information, please send it to realagluck at gmail.com that way I can look into it and see what I can find. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like, share, and comment as it truly helps. If you like this subject, check out the other videos in the series. I will see you all in the next episode of Remy.